for banks, same time last year, while the system went through a complete uh, you know, grind and was uh, tested both in terms of the supply chain management and payment collections, RBI's uh, RBI moratorium and uh, Government of India credit uh, guarantee schemes mm -hmm. did give a very big uh, support to the MSME and SMEs. In the second wave, when the number of uh, cases are significantly higher than first cases, what would be the impact? Banks today are saying that they have a lot of capital buffer, but is it too early for them to say that they are prepared or banks this time are genuinely prepared? Uh, Tamilda, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Past experience has told, taught us some lessons, which is that in terms of crisis, how can you manage the banking sector? But given that the pandemic right now in sheer proportion is so large that it will start having impact on the working population and also the productivity. Are we staring at something which will unfold in coming weeks or this time it's genuinely different? Um. Yeah, Nikunj, I actually, I may sound like a Cassandra, uh, but um, I am, I think we are staring at something very unpleasant for the banking industry. If there are two ifs are there, if the government and Reserve Bank of India do not come forward to handle them. Now, let me go back a little bit of background. Last year, um, there was a nationwide lockdown. And then there was a uh, combined effort both by the regulator in terms of moratorium and opening up lots of liquidity windows. Uh, and then government, which you mentioned, this uh, credit, uh, partially credit guarantee scheme of 3 trillion. To the, my understanding, 3 trillion rupees, 3 lakh crore rupees. To, my, to the best of my understanding, uh, about 2.5 trillion been uh, sanctioned and 2 trillion been disbursed. Now, what are the results of all these things? Results are actually is a quite a pleasant surprise. If you see the Reserve Bank of India's financial sector stability report, that six monthly health check in January, it had projected, not predicted, projected that NPA could go up as much as from 7.9% to 13.5% for the industry by September 2021. In the That's the base case scenario. Worst case scenario could be 14.8%. But as we speak, March 31st results have started coming up. You have seen that uh, banks are holding on pretty resilient balance sheet, and I think it will continue to. So my understanding is by March 31st, 7.5% uh, NPA would go up about 9.5%. Two percentage point will rise uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for, two, for primarily two reasons. One is about... about Two percentage of total banking assets, two trillion, roughly two trillion core, have been restructured by 31st March, and and another two trillion, are, um, you know, will come as NPAs. But if this second wave, the virulence, what we have seen, uh, it it is it is much more uh, fiercer than than the first wave. That's point number one. If you see the number of uh, people affected, uh, it's much higher. Yes, there is no lockdown, but state after state, cities after cities are coming under lockdown. So there is what is not happening. And other part of this, some parts till recently, till till recently, we were talking about only urban centers. You know, uh, are more affected or whatever it is. Uh, rural India is safe. First wave, rural India was safe. This time, you are looking, you are seeing what's happening in UP. Rural India is not safe. And we are yet to see what would happen to West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, and Assam in the first week of May, post-election results. So it is much, much uh, severe impact. Uh, uh, in that segment, MSMEs and SMEs, and uh, retail segment, primarily in the informal sector. Corporate India can hold on. So I think this, this particular quarter, as we speak, in April, if you ask any banker, they will say, no, collections are more or less on the similar line. It's not. But in May and June, I think in, the, in this quarter, I, will, I, I see substantial uh, NPA being created. Uh, people are uh, the traders, small traders and small borrowers, in, in, even in rural India in some cases, and mostly in urban Indias, they will not be able to uh, service bank loans. 
I repeat, they are not corporate. Corporate India is relatively safe. Corporate India, not, nothing to worry about. In a, uh, rather, put it this way, banking sector does not need to worry much about corporate India. So these are the guys, and they are not Niram Modi's. They are not Kingfisher Airlines. Uh, so I think they need help. Uh, th that that's a limited point I am making. And uh, those who could not hold on to it, they have already turned into NPS. Despite all this uh, uh, windows of restructuring and moratorium, uh, etc., they have already turned NPS, uh, and they probably would not come back to to business. But those who could withstand the first wave. Now they are in a bad situation or would be in a bad situation over the next two months. They need some helping hand. If, uh, if, our, um, if our government does not come forward and if our regulator feels no, uh, let's not postpone the problem, let's face it up, uh, then, uh, then I think Reserve Bank of India's prediction of 13.5% NPA by September would come true. A projection rather not prediction i said uh, would come true so i i would like to believe about four percentage point four lakh crore roughly uh, it could be anywhere between three and five lakh but roughly four lakh crore worth of uh, msme sme retail loans would turn bad in this quarter okay my next follow-up question is that do you see an impact which is going to be perhaps a painful one for the microfinance and for the MFI, MFI space given that you just mentioned Bengal, uh, the real numbers from there will only start coming from elections. There are MFIs you are associated with which have become small banks. You understand that space very well. Is that space in some trouble? Uh Again, I just said it's it's not um, it's not the microfinance. Even the when I spoke about this four percentage point NP is going up, I I am talking about the entire banking system. So if you look at the microfinance per se, against they will be in they will be in uh, uh, you call it trouble, you call it crisis, you could you call it problem, whatever it is, and their problem will be both end. Uh, liquidity uh, uh, in their own balance sheet because once they are not in the best of health and their NP is growing, banks will not be forthcoming to give them money. I'm talking about the microfinance entities. And uh, so the liquidity, if the bank's liquidity tap gets closed, uh, then they are in, uh, they will not be in the best of health. In fact, if you remember last time during the moratorium, there was a lot of issues there. Microfinance uh, entities were offering moratorium to their uh, uh, borrowers, but the banks were unwilling to offer moratorium to uh, to, my, to their borrowers, that's the microfinance entities. So they were caught between the crossfires. Now, as we speak, my understanding is uh, both in Assam, not the upper Assam where the problems are there, but in lower Assam and in West Bengal, collections are actually better, has gone up in January, February, it's gone up. But in the second half, as, as I said, uh, we have it's still unfolding to quote you uh, the scenario. April just started. It's not going to end by end April. Uh, and after this, three states um, come out of the elections and uh, we, we get to know their numbers. Probably the peak we'll see sometime in May, May end. Uh, I'm not a uh, medical practitioner, so I'm just whatever hearing I'm repeating. So which means uh, if it uh, peaks in May end and then if it recedes sometime uh, June end, the entire quarter is lost. So yes, microfinance also will be affected. Uh, other issues also, there's a little technical issue. Some of the states, like say Uttarakhand, uh, has not, uh, not uh, identified microfinance as an essential service. So there, the collection agents cannot work when, uh, when the other things have come to a standstill, whether the bankers can work. But I think this is a technical issue. It can be it can be sorted out because the Home Ministry circular last year uh, uh, identified microfinance as an essential service. So some states have not yet done it. That's a technical issue that can be taken care of. But the larger issues is this, people are losing jobs, uh, um, shops are being closed, and which was happening till now as we speak in urban centers like Bombay and Bangalore and Delhi, uh, they are talking about. Uh, now it's now getting into rural, and which is very different from the first wave. In the first wave, everybody was talking about that rural India is holding on and that that's a new growth driver is rural India. But now 
after the second wave, I don't think we'll be able to say that. Look at what's happening in rural India now. So yes, it's, it, is, it is a critical scenario for microfinance as well. So I think uh, I, I would like to believe uh, uh, there is something needs to be done. If not a blanket moratorium for everybody, maybe for certain section moratorium on loans, uh, Reserve Bank of India under under the RBI Act, Section 21, 35A, 36, it has the power to direct and advise banks uh, to do certain things. Like when you see some natural calamity in certain uh, certain localities, uh, certain regions, uh, banks are being asked to. Uh, to do uh, to treat their borrowers in a different way, so either sector specific or region specific, uh, RBI can certainly do. Uh, and also, uh, restructuring window which closed in March, uh, it can be extended or it can be reopened uh, for this segment. And the government three trillion um, uh, credit guarantee, partial credit guarantee scheme, where people have already availed of. I think they can have a second go, or it can, in a much larger, much smaller scale, government can open another credit guarantee scheme. And where you take probably, say, 10% uh, loan default government takes on, and you give 25,000 rupees, just about 25,000 rupees, uh, to a few million customers. It will, it, will, it will just cost a few thousand crore uh, if you just do the calculation. So we need a combined effort, both by the government and Reserve Bank of India, uh, whether in terms of restructuring, in terms of select mor selective moratorium, or in terms of fresh fund flow. Otherwise, um, otherwise I, I, would, I, would, I would like to believe the NPAs will, bad assets will grow despite the bank's best effort. And, you know, this is, banks are, banks are, uh, now, I mean, let's give it to them. Bankers are prudent now. I don't think they can afford to misuse. So I think we need to trust them. We need to trust them. And the borrowers are not, again, I'm repeating, not Kingfishers and Niram Modis. They're losing their livelihoods. They're losing their, they're losing their lives. So let's, let, let's take it. No, it's not postponing the problem. It's facing the problem uh, up front sure. and tackling it. Sure. You know, the one problem, Tamal, that was there even pre-pandemic, and, the, you know, the issue was never about liquidity. It was about banks and financial institutions being averse to lending to stress sectors. Has that changed or think the problem has only worsened because of the pandemic now? No, certainly that, certainly that has worsened. No? Certainly that has, that has worsened. Uh, but these are, not, uh, these are not traditional stress sectors which we are talking about. We are talking about those uh, MSMEs and SMEs and retail customers, say like even the uh, low cost uh, housing where the people have taken. Now, if they are losing their daily wages, if they are losing their uh, livelihood, then how would they service? So they are, it, it, this is not a traditional stress, stress sector. They are under stress, uh, come under stress. So they, they could withstand the first wave. So give it to them with the bank support, the RBI support and the government support, they could withstand the first wave and they started paying off. And now the second wave is, is hitting them harder. So they need handholding. And as far as banks, risk averseness or prudence, whatever you call it, uh, that's still on because, and which is why I, I did say that banks are, we need to trust them that they have become prudent. On the other side of prudence is they are not as liberal as they were in the past giving money uh, because they are uh, always uh, scared of being held up by investigative agencies and so on and so forth. Uh, so that uh, that's, uh, I would say, gray area. Uh, uh, they will call themselves prudent and we will call them the risk covers. Uh, they are not forthcoming to give uh, giving loans uh, people. That's, that's a separate story. But now what the stress we are seeing, it is the COVID second wave induced stress is, is the genuine stress. And I am repeating, corporate India uh, does not need any kind of help as of now. It's the MSMEs, SMEs, and the retail investors in the informal segment, which are the actually the drivers of Indian economy, they need the support. And we need to trust the bankers, they will not misuse 
uh, this kind of window which they had done in the past they have not misused this in the recent past uh, and in the first first wave of covid which is why we are seeing the restructuring they were allowed to restructure but only roughly about 2 trillion rupees 2% of entire assets are being restructured. Only about, if I'm not mistaken, I'm just predicting as things unfolding, about 2 percentage point NPAs would go up. So they have not misused uh, what they have given to them, the ammunitions to tackle COVID effect. So I think they would not misuse if, and they would need some kind of handholding and support. Because once a corporate, once uh, the corporate is uh, identified as an NPA, the second part is, uh, sorry, not the corporate, the borrower identified NPA, however small is, uh, because the credit bureau think that borrower will, will not get the money again from the, uh, from the banking system. So they have to say goodbye to entrepreneurship. That also you have to keep that in mind. Fair point, Tamal. Great to get in all that perspective from you. Good speaking with you as always. We're going to take a very quick break on that note with news that we're still holding on to 14,750 for the Nifty Futures. Breath is first standing tall and it's the earnings reactions along with an info edge, which is the newsmaker this morning.